when I suggested this title, um, it seemed sufficiently good to say what I was going to say, but then actually Jeff said, well, what you're actually talking about is how doctors were informed about drugs through advertising, so that's really a subtitle. I can do the next bit quickly because it's been introduced really. That's Sir William Payton, Bill Payton, who gave the uh, money for the start of this award. That's the second person I want to uh, thank. As you heard from the previous speaker, David was not only a great clinical pharmacologist, he was an ex outstanding experimental neuropharmacologist, and that's why I wanted to join him in Oxford when he set the unit up in 1973. And by being there and mixing with clinical pharmacologists and going to some of David's lectures, ground rounds, prescription of the week, etc., it gave me actually enough understanding of, of clinical pharmacology to even think that I might attempt to uh, do this study. The third person, th there's Jeff working away on, on, our, uh, on our studies uh, with the journals in front of us. Having met Jeff in 73, he was the, we've worked together and published various things over many years, and uh, he was the obvious person to go to to uh, get some confidence in what was going to be investigated and talked about. The first, fourth person is actually a psychiatrist, Peter Haddad. Uh, he and I wrote that book for the 40th uh, years of, of the BAP. And it was in doing the study of uh, clinical psychopharmacology uh, that I realized just actually how bad much of the advertising was. Not necessarily because of hyperbole that just goes through advertising. It was actually how ignorant uh, people were about the drugs uh, that they were advertising. Why did we choose? choose 1950 to 1980 as our area? Well, it's because, in fact, until uh, about 1950 or so, gosh, I don't think that it does work, but it's so poor, um, there were very few drugs becoming available, and then you can see there was a flood of uh, new drugs coming onto the market uh, from about 1955 onwards to 1960, and it then carried on. Why did we stop in 1980 uh, or around there? Well, you'll see that in a, in a few minutes. But basically, advertising dropped off enormously after 1980. Uh, we're not quite sure of the reasons. Uh, partly it's probably the Medicines Act and much tighter regulation. Uh, but also probably companies felt it was much more cost effective to uh, focus down on either scientific meetings or, or, meet, uh, or sending out their reps to uh, individual physicians. Our source materials, the BMJ, uh, which was really pretty well mandatory reading for any uh, doctor in those days uh, and which carried a lot of advertising, uh, more specialist journals really didn't carry advertising in any amount at all and, uh, until much later. And the second journal was World Medicine, which was formed in the early 1960s and went on till about 1984, I think. And that was a lot of their adverts were in colour. It was a. <laughs> for older people. It was a bit like Punch. It was a mixture of serious art, uh, articles and much more humorous uh, stuff. And uh, it was also free. It relied on actually advertising uh, for its income. And it was sent free to every, uh, every doctor in the UK. The BMJ recognized that it was actually an important source uh, because that's an advert within its advertising section. This shows actually the advertising and the companies uh, and the number of products in 55 to 56, uh, 65, 75 and 85. 
And you can see by 1955, we've gone from almost no advertising at all to around 1,400 adverts, going up even more uh, in 1965. 340 products going down to 260. And this, this will stagger the, the, the younger doctors. 88 companies in those days, a lot of them have merged, uh, a lot of them have disappeared, particularly with uh, products that were subsequently shown to be not actually very effective. But you can see that it really drops down, and by 1985, uh, very few companies, very few adverts, and very few products. The BMJ didn't only have pharmaceuticals. It showed nice, expensive cars for the consultant uh, to, to uh, go to hospital. Uh, this shows how old it is. Uh, uh, tires so that the GP could uh, drive his car safely and go and see his patients. The cigarettes that the doctor should smoke. Books and journals, there's our own journal being advertised. Importantly for a lot of people, that's where they could find a new job. And I like this one, even Guinness. Oh, Gu oh Guinness is a noble brew, it's good for me and it's good for you. Regulation only started in, in 1958, and that is about 86 pages now. That little pamphlet at the top covered everything from hospitality to free samples, and that section I, I've emphasized there uh, says what they should do in promotional terms. Promotional activities must not mislead either directly or by implication. That was pretty well ignored. Effective promotional activities taken as a whole should give a complete and balanced picture of the product to the doctor. Side effects and contraindications must be clearly stated. That was almost totally ignored. Uh, statements based on clinical and pharmacological evidence and those based on theoretical speculation must be clearly differentiated. Uh, that was ignored. Uh, scientific work must be quoted fairly. Uh, ditto. Disparaging references to competing medical specialties and manufacturers must be avoided. That was pretty well agreed on, but I think that was uh, because they were frightened of tit-for-tat uh, activities there. And you couldn't actually really talk about costs. There's all sorts of social aspects one can pick up in these adverts. First thing is doctors were male. They were male in the 1950s and they were male in the 1970s when you look at the adverts. Uh, you can see there in hospital, uh, the doctor would be there usually with an attractive nurse standing the suitable step behind him. And he'd hold his glasses in his hands, presumably to show that there was some intimacy in this, this discussion. Uh, if he was a GP, he was middle-aged, uh, wore a nice suit, and again, you can see he's learned the technique of uh, holding the glasses in the hand to talk intimately. Woman's place was clearly in the home in all the adverts. This is an advert from about 1952, and you can see that uh, uh, the lady there is expected to sew, uh, use the latest technology to wash the clothes and mangle them, uh, do all the cooking, do the knitting, and do the shopping. And this shows an indication of this was 1952 because that little booklet at the front there uh, it is actually a ration book uh, for food. Uh, the drug suggested is uh, amphetamine there, which presumably made her do all these tasks more rapidly at any rate. <laughs> if it's male in the advert, then the expectation is he would be uh, going off to work. Women are also more likely to be patient. This is Bella Jow, uh, when the symptoms are due to autonomic imbalance, whatever that means. Uh, but clearly, the, giving a drug that had an uh, ergot, belladonna, uh, and phenobarbitone uh, was considered to be suitable. Uh, 
that's for an antidepressant. <laughs> Do I need to tell you? If, if your patient was a woman and did get better, then obviously it was expected she'd go back to doing what she was supposed to do in those days, uh, which is sh looking after the children and shopping. Whereas if he was male, then he got back to work. A whole lot wouldn't be acceptable today, but you know we must be careful not to judge this too strongly uh, on, on what we, we feel now. That's for monoamine oxidase inhibitor, an antidepressant. And the poor little chap sitting on the steps there, they then focused in on subsequent adverts uh, as being depressed, as well he might be uh, judging by what's happening around him. Uh, that's one of Hogarth's uh, engravings and is Bedlam. I don't think any company would dare show a picture of a cat with implanted electrodes in the brain now. They obviously felt doctors shouldn't be overloaded with, with information. Evidence exists to show that some sulfonamides are better alone than in combination. And evidence also exists to the contrary. Figures, graphs, etc., can become tiresome. <laughs> you can see the guy there is totally confused by uh, publications. You could go the way that Roche did, which is to not give any information at all. Uh, the Librium adverts don't say anything about the drug, not even what it's for. Uh, Valium one on the right, exactly the same. No information at all. And this is well into the 1960s. Uh, Mogadon, they tell you it's the successor to the hypnotics, but uh, again, no more information than that. Dosages, even into the 60s, were sometimes in apothecary's weights. Um, so if at least Abbott here told you uh, the dosing in terms of pentobarbital belladonna, uh, in terms of grains and in milligrams, but then really rather spoil it by telling you it's equivalent to about seven minims of tincture belladonna, This can get more of a problem with a physician uh, in that period because uh, <coughs> this really was a golden age of com uh, combination therapy. The one on the left has mefenacin, which is a sedative, carbamol, which is a sedative, uh, bromide, which is a sedative, and ascorbic acid. And the doses there are in milligrams. But if you look at the one on the right, this is, also has carbotol uh, and pentobarbital, but the doses are only in grains of, of each substance. So you would have the distinct problem if you wanted to switch over or add to work out actually how much of any particular substance you were giving. You also didn't actually have to prove that your drug worked before you advertised it. This is isoniazid. Read the clinical trials are being continued. In view of the urgent need for wider confirmation of this early work, Rimifern has been made available to all hospitals and tuberculosis centers. And there were two other companies advertising at the same time, and all of them were essentially asking hospitals and clinics uh, to do some clinical trials for them because they uh, clearly had extremely little evidence. And this one, uh, megamide, which is a, a, a barbiturate antidote, Nicholas Products are anxious to assist all those interested and will be pleased to make small supplies of megamide available to those medical practitioners who may wish to carry out trials. Um, quite staggering, really. I only put that on because a year before I went to university, I worked for Nicholas Products, so I remember testing that as a raw product. Sometimes you've got text that you just laughed at almost. I love this one. It's my favorite. She needed the true tranquilizing effect and the invaluable alerting action of stelazine. 
Now, if anyone, even the copywriters, can explain to me how you can be tranquilized and alerted at the same time, um, I would love to hear it. And this one is for the pharmacokineticists in the audience. Um, if you go down to the third line, there is little or no drug trespass into the cerebral or spinal cord areas. Yeah, <laughs> I bet. It didn't seem to worry necessarily too much about safety or dependence problems either. This is epitone. Some say strychnine is the only true tonic. Uh, yes, uh, depending on how much you take, I guess. Um, and actually, metatone was being advertised by Park Davis in the mid-1960s, and it still contains strychnine. Welcome were advertising methadone, uh, where they say that each dose is so small that the risk of addiction is negligible. Uh, but they don't tell you what the dose is. To, to get the information on the dose, you have to go to page 40 of your welcome medical diary. OK, so that's some of the background and some of the adverts. Let, let's just look at a few therapeutic areas. Jeff and I divided the adverts up into the major therapeutic areas. Uh, this was one of his main tasks, I have to say, in the whole thing, in making sure we got this right. Uh, and you can see from either BMJ or World Medicine, there wasn't actually very much variation in the most advertised drugs uh, right through that period. World Medicine was slightly different because I think it was advertised more for general practitioners. Uh, but nevertheless, infection is near the top the whole time. Cardiovascular right the way through, gastrointestinal, respiratory, uh, and then neurology, psychiatry there as well. And if you look at the smaller graph, um, it's clear that actually there was a very close relationship between the number of adverts in every therapeutic area and the number of products. Uh, that is, no one particular um, therapeutic area was being pushed very much harder than any other area. So let's go through a few of these areas. In the 1950s, the main treatment for hypertension were, was actually uh, the Raoulfa alkaloids, reserpine. Uh, and you'll notice in small print there that each best batch is tested in dogs for its effectiveness in producing hypertension, bradycardia, and sedation. And as it's a natural product, that's presumably the only way they could uh, assess uh, actually potency at all. But by the early 60s, we'd got the ganglion blocking drugs and the thiazide diuretics. And then a very major drug came along, uh, Aldomet, alpha methyl dopa, uh, which I think would, have, as an antihypertensive, would, would have really uh, hit the market for many years, almost unchallenged. Uh, it was certainly a, a very uh, much used drug uh, in that period, apart from the fact that this was then advertised, which was the birth of a whole new therapeutic area, Aldolin. This is a beta blocker, and Sir James Black, the discoverer, said he, he suspected this was the first time uh, that most uh, physicians had ever been exposed to the, to the word receptor uh, in an advert. It didn't actually last very long because the period between a drug being discovered and going onto the market was so short uh, that actually this was on the market before some longer term uh, tests had been performed in terms of toxicity. And it was then found that this drug actually was carcinogenic and it was removed from the market bare, uh, within a few months of it actually going on. However, ICI had uh, what was the uh, new product uh, that became 
key to their success, uh, which is indrol, propranolol. Uh, and if you notice the relationship between aldolin and indrol in terminology, uh, they, they used, um, I've forgotten the word, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you. Um, they took the term Alderley Park, which was where the drug was discovered, and then used Alderley and, and uh, adapted the, 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 uh, the letters around. It's a beta blocking agent, but it actually went on as a, a as a anti a, a anti arrhythmic for uh, two or three years before it really became available as an anti hypertensive. And then by the early 70s, yet another uh, corruption of the world, orderly held in, and this is Practolol, uh, the first actually uh, beta-1 selective drug. And they didn't use that term in this study, but they, in this advert, but they did call it cardioselective. And this actually was around, I, I think, for, for three or four years before, uh, again, it had severe toxicity problems uh, and was removed from the market. Happily, uh, this wasn't an effect uh, uh, of all beta-1 selective drugs, and not that long afterwards, uh, metoprolol, uh, which was discovered by Astra, uh, was then started to be marketed by Geige. And they do call it a modern beta, uh, beta blocker, a beta-1 selective drug. It was followed by several others, uh, finally by tenormin atenolol, and the interest in, in, in this advert is that it was actually marketed by Stewart Pharmaceuticals. And Stewart is actually the American arm of ICI, and one does wonder whether, because of all the problems they'd have with Practolol, uh, they decided they'd market it under the name of Stewart uh, rather than ICI Pharmaceuticals. Me Probamate was considered to be the first be, uh, blockbuster drug. Uh, started to be marketed in 1955-56, and uh, the advert shows a gated large psychiatric hospital. The problem in psychiatry was that until around 1960, <coughs> whether it was what we now tend to think of as anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, were actually just classified, drugs were classified on the basis that they were tranquilizers, uh, and they were thought maybe to treat everything. And that's certainly how Mil uh, Milltown became so, uh, so important. However, they learned, and by, interestingly, by uh, 1962-63, the whole thing had shifted from being uh, a drug for the seriously disturbed psychiatric patient to a drug that actually would enable people to remain at work. Uh, so that, that was a big move. Shortly after meprobamate came onto the market, chlorpromazine appeared in France, uh, and by the early 1960s, uh, this was the advert, do you make it your, enough use of it? Quite frightening when you actually look at this advert that uh, uh, chlorpromazine is being suggested to be quite suitable uh, even for babies, as you can see on the right. Then several other um, <coughs> phenothiazines came on the market. But then in 61, haloperidol appeared. And what is interesting in this is that, as I've said, you used not to get this, shall we say, diagnosis uh, of best use for a drug. Uh, a major tranquilizer would do for everything. Haloperidol is being suggested to be useful in schizophrenic symptoms, paranoia, and mania. They're not suggesting it's useful for everything. And then by the later uh, 60s, we're getting the depot 
compounds, including the uh, flufenazines. If you look at the chlorpromazine structure, uh, you can see the distinct similarity with imipramine. And, and that's the reason that the chemists, once they started to hear that uh, chlorpromazine was useful, chemists in all the other different companies started to try and manipulate the structure. Uh, and imipramine was the first one. That's a 1959 advert uh, when imipramine first came onto the market. Um, Jeff discovered actually the word thymoleptic had never been used in this country uh, until this advert, and uh, uh, it will now appear as the first use in uh, the Oxford English Dictionary following his phone call to them. And again, we're starting to see that uh, psychiatric illness is being classified, and it says it's not suitable for the treatment of schizophrenia, and it's not a tranquilizer. <coughs> Several other companies then started to produce Me Too drugs. You can see a whole list of them there. But Roche clearly decided that actually um, they could still treat everything. And this was advertised in 1960. It's a neuroleptic, it's a thymoleptic, and it's a tranquilizer. Uh, there were about 12 adverts in the first year for it, and then it almost totally disappeared. Uh, it actually wasn't a very good uh, wasn't a very good neuroleptic and it had very strong anticholinergic effects. Uh, so therapeutically it wasn't very useful, but it, uh, it was pretty good with uh, side effects. Uh, so that disappeared. When we get to the sedatives and hypnotics, this is typical. Uh, it has pentobarbitone, which was discovered in 1910 in Germany, Carbamel, which was discovered in 1912, uh, and this is still available in the early 50s. But then this came along, a safe uh, sedative. This is a notorious advert by now. It was almost impossible with this drug uh, to get an LD50, which is why it was called very safe. Uh, and they're suggesting that the child there even if it swallows a large number of tablets from the uh, medicine cabinet, will still be safe. The reason it's notorious is this is thalidomide and uh, produced uh, teratogenic abnormalities uh, in women that had taken the drug during the early stages of pregnancy. But at almost the same time as all the problems that were coming up with thalidomide, Roche came along first of all with chlordiazepoxide, epoxide, Librium, and then Valium. And the interesting thing about this advert for Valium is the sheer emphasis that it puts on uh, as to how many animal species it's been tested on, how many patients. And this is, they're really saying, you know, we've had all these problems uh, with thalidomide, but look, we're giving you a safe drug. So safe that they said, you know, get your patients onto this rather than the barbiturates because barbiturates are poisonous. And uh, uh, they emphasize this extremely clearly with the advert on the right showing a gravestone. Result of this was that in 1960, uh, the red line, benzodiazepines, were less than 5% of the total uh, psychiatric drug uh, advertising market, and that's all actually uh, chlordiazepoxide, and then a whole lot of other ones came along. So that by 1970, they were 25% of the adverts. As you can see, barbiturates were 25% roughly of the market uh, in 1960. 5% in 1970, and there were no adverts at all for, uh, for barbiturates by, uh, by 1975. 
And then there was this advert about Librium. 10 anxious years of aggravation and demonstration, Cuba and Vietnam, assassination and devaluation, Biafra and Czechoslovakia, uh, Librium with its specific calming actions and remarkable safety margin, a unique and still growing role. Those older members may remember this from the Rolling Stones, track one, size one, mother's a little helper. Mother needs something today to calm her down. And though she's not really ill, there's a little yellow pill. She goes running for the shelter of a mother's little helper. And it helps her on her way, gets her through a busy day. <coughs> Generally con considered that the song was about benzodiazepines. With Parkinson's disease, we got the anticholinergics coming along in the 1950s. But again, you can see further trials are in progress, but initial results have been fa sufficiently favorable to allow immediate release of uh, chemodrin, and then artane. But then in 1970, in some ways, the most remarkable advertising campaign of M we saw was this. Uh, Roche, uh, almost in the way of, of uh, official documents, as it were, produced these two-page adverts uh, about L-DOPA. There have been clinical trials in academic centers uh, suggesting that L-DOPA would be really valuable. And uh, they probably thought they had to market, but then in 1974, MSD came along uh, with L-DOPA combined with Carbidopa, which was very clever pharmacology which is a drug that stopped, actually, the peripheral metabolism of L-DOPA. So it put, as their, one of their adverts said, L-DOPA in the brain, uh, which meant you could bring the dose down enormously and reduce the number of side effects. With refractory drugs, isoprenaline in the 1950s, uh, nice to see Boots using the term pharmacology. And then Riker came along with, with I mean, sometimes you feel that Medihaler has taken the, uh, the way that Hoover has gone in terms of just being a generic name uh, for inhalers. Uh, Riker is an interesting company in that they were a major pharmaceutical company. Uh, they got bought out by 3M and then they, they moved out of pharmaceuticals altogether. Uh, but Medihaler enabled isoprenaline to be delivered. And then the next big drug was Fison's drug, uh, Intel, sodium chromoglycate, which was very dominant in the market. And we're starting to see, shall we say, more scientific adverts here, uh, showing not a picture of patients or doctors, but actually the, the system of delivery until the very late 1960s, uh, when we're really starting to see proper scientific adverts uh, with salbutamol, with Ventolin, uh, with results, uh, and, and a whole lot of information on its pharmacology, side effects, and so on. Big advance. Gastrointestinal drugs, uh, with modern ones, were very late onto the market. Uh, Nulacin is actually uh, a dried milk powder with, with, with um, some other uh, antacid substances in, and you put that in your mouth and you sucked it. Uh, but again, in the early 50s, they were actually showing some scientific pharmacological results. Uh, but even by the 70s, we're still talking about uh, uh, aluminium hydroxide and uh, dealing with the inflamed stomach. That's the worst advert I think we saw. Uh, it doesn't, this is in mid-1970s and they're still not saying what it is. It was actually a deglycerinized uh, licorice uh, together with antacid substances, uh, but it doesn't tell you anything about it, not even what it is. But happily, 
soon after that was on the market, we got, again, the first of modern pharmaceuticals with cimetidine coming on uh, in 1976, 70, 76, 77, and again, a much more scientific advertising. Promised, large promise is the soul to any advertisement. That Samuel Johnson in his own magazine in the 20th of January, 1759. So it's interesting to see whether what we've been talking about has fulfilled its promise. Well, with CNS, phenothiazines are on the market, butylphenones are still there, tricyclics are there, uh, and there's an interesting thing there that the first advert uh, for amitriptyline appeared in 1961. A recent meta-analysis of all antidepressants, including the more recent SSRIs, etc., uh, showed that amitriptyline is still the most effective antidepressant. Uh, so uh, we haven't come a long way since 1971, really. Benzodiazepines are still there. Dopa and decarboxylase are still important. Many of the things that I'm, suggest uh, I'm mentioning here actually are on the, uh, you know, the WHO list of, of, of essential medicines. Cardiovascular, alpha methyl dopa, not really. Tharsides, yes. Beta blockers and beta 1 selective drugs, yes, still around. Respiratory, the beta agonist, the medihaler, yes. Beta 2 selective agonist, yes. Chromo, uh, sodium chromoglycate, you'll still find in some places around the world. Gastrointestinal, antacids, well, yes, over the counter. Uh, H2 histamine antagonists, of course, are now over the counter. Uh, I haven't mentioned the um, drugs like uh, omeprazole because that's into the 80s. So, what can we conclude? From the 50s to the 80s, the medical profession was actually extensively informed about pharmacological advances in therapeutics through these advertisements. And many of the novel drugs that were advertised and I've talked about at that time have proved to be of lasting value. Um, adverts may not have been accurate always, but these adverts were informing people and a lot of them have proved to be drugs uh, of enormous value to therapeutics. And if any of you want to read any more, then uh, you're welcome to go back to our papers that have been published in the last year or so. Thank you.